Good morning, church. I just want to say I am glad that you are here. There's a lot of places in this community you could have chosen to worship today. If you're tuned in online, we're glad you're with us. And we're going to get started on a new series called Counterculture. I want you to turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. I don't have time this morning to go into every small piece of our culture that is currently contrary to God's Word. But I would say, like many generations before us have said, that this is probably the most depraved, desperate, anti-God, anti-Bible culture in the history of the world. And some of the recent things that have happened in our culture lead me to feel like this series is so appropriate. We, uh, as leadership, we've been reading through a book written by David Platt of the same name, and we're, we're so moved by some of the things he said and by the text we just finished preaching through in Second Peter that we feel compelled now to talk about some really difficult, intense issues that are facing our culture right now today. So as we're moving forward through this series, my hope is that your heart will be open and receptive to hearing God's take from His Word on current, uh, intense, cultural issues. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is waiting around for some of his traveling companions in Athens. Athens was a very learned, academic, intellectual city, one of, the intele- one of the most intellectual cities of the day. The Apostle Paul has finished his first miss- missionary journey. He's participated in the Jerusalem Council. Now he's carrying g- the gospel to the Gentile world. And in Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, while Paul is waiting on his traveling companions in Athens, a very learned, academic, very pagan city, he becomes greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now, if we were to pause right there and take this text out of context, I think that really describes the status of our nation and even world today, that it is a world literally full of idols. Certainly there are some religions that involve really obvious forms of idolatry, but there are some very distinct, consistent over time idols in the culture here in the United States of America. Uh, Idols like money, idols like sex, More, more difficult to see idols like a spirit of pride or a spirit of unforgiveness. These are things that lead us away from the Lord God and into the culture in which we exist. Anything that leads us away from God and into the culture in our lives can be and often is an idol. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 16, Paul is immersed very much in a culture like ours in Athens. He notices the need. The first thing that has to happen in our culture, just like in Paul's situation, for us to notice the need is we have to be available. The second thing that has to happen is we have to be affected. So how can we make ourselves available? I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul written to the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 16. You should write this down. Paul says we're to make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. To the Colossian church in chapter 4, verse 5, he says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Friends, you have to be available in the world in which you live. I think one of the main methods the enemy uses to take Christians out of the fight of transforming culture is putting us on this pace of busyness where we go through our lives physically present but not emotionally or spiritually present. We're physically present, but we're absent in all other areas. We're unavailable. The Apostle Paul would say, you have to make the most of every opportunity. It could be anything, waiting in the uh, lines in Walmart. In the South, the Walmarts are so well run, we don't have any lines. Pumping gas at the gas station, walking along the road, mowing your lawn, 
Make the most of every opportunity. Constantly look for ways to engage with people and be available to people as they live in the same culture you live in. Here's the reality. You have the secret to transforming culture. The secret is the gospel. As many opportunities as you can, make yourself available for transformation of the world around you. The second thing that we see in Acts 17, 16 is not only is Paul available, he's waiting around, and in his waiting, he notices a need, and the notice of the need compels him to feel greatly distressed according to the scriptures. The Apostle Paul sees the idolatry and fallenness of the paganism around him, and he's greatly distressed. I want to say one thing about this really quickly. Paul is greatly distressed at the nature of their condition, which is sinfulness. He's not greatly distressed at his discomfort with their behavior. For me, there's a difference. I think often we see behavior that's obviously, egregiously sinful. And we take up arms and want to be combative. I'm going to talk about that in a minute and really throw scripture and attitude and emotion at that particular behavior because it's the behavior that we're uncomfortable with. And we altogether lose sight of the reality of the desperation of people who are lost in the middle of sin. Paul's, dis- Paul's distress is a distress that moves him to compassion, not combativeness. I'm reminded of the story we find in Nehemiah. The Israelites are in exile. Nehemiah is uh, the king's cupbearer. He would drink the wine or juice or whatever of the king before the king drank it and would sample the food to make sure it wasn't poison. Nehemiah had been exiled from his home, Israel, specifically the area near Jerusalem. And in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1, the story picks up like this. These are the words of Nehemiah, son of Hilkiah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. So Nehemiah is asking his brother, hey, what happened to all those guys that are still in Jerusalem that survived the exile, that didn't actually get sent away from our home country? Then these people said to me, Nehemiah, those who survived the exile are back in and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and even prayed before the God of heaven. Friends, we've got to be affected by the fallenness of the culture around us. The Apostle Paul was distressed to the point of compassion in the same way Nehemiah was distressed to the point of compassion, who ends up pleading his case to the king and leading hundreds of thousands of Israelites back to the land of promise. If we're going to really be affected and uh, see the need and notice the need in our community, it's important to remember, though, that we, as much as we have to be available and affected, we have to be abstinent from the sin sickness that resides within the culture. Can I get a witness to that this morning? We can't be sinning alongside cultural fallen individuals Monday through Saturday and then Sunday try and lead those same people out of the sins that we're totally immersed in every other day of the week. The Apostle Paul had been delivered. He's in Athens and sees the idolatry and he can immediately see the need because he's not initiating or continuing that kind of behavior in his own life. So what are some ways we can respond to culture? If we see the need, if we notice the need, how can we respond? Well, one option would be to cocoon. I often have this fantasy of Kirsten and I, my bride and I, selling everything that we own and buying a yurt in Nome, Alaska and living off fish and hunting for the rest of our lives. No cell phones, no computers, no television and uh, no, no trouble aside from making sure our guns have ammunition and our fishing poles have bait on the ends of them. Sometimes that thought of just not having to deal with the cultural pressure of day-to-day American Western life seems inviting. But if we're going to live out the Great Commission in our life, then we don't have that as an option. Jesus says in Matthew 20, 28, 19, you, whoever you are, 
You're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations. Friends, that means everybody. That means people of different socioeconomic classes than you. That means people of different races. That means people potentially of different problems or gift sets or talents or abilities or education. You don't have one minute to run and hide from the culture that desperately needs you to get in the game and work towards transformation of that culture. We could cocoon from the culture. We could also conform to the cultural standard. I think this idea is the idea that makes me feel like this particular generation is maybe the most depraved, desperate generation in the history of the world because the pressure to conform is greater than I've ever felt it, have, it has ever been. This is the politically correct, postmodern atmosphere in which we exist. And this idea has influenced churches and doctrine and theology to the very highest levels. We can't conform if we are also going to try and transform. But that transformation sometimes may compel us to feeling combative or angry or frustrated. And perhaps we even feel like there are times we'd like to just take up arms and defend the rights of unborn children or defend the reality of biblical marriage. But our distress, in the same way that it can't lead to confirmation and adapt to cultural standards, it also can't lead to combativeness and violence. So what's the solution? If we're really going to transform culture, we have to first be transformed. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. How does nonconformity start in the life of a human being? The Apostle Paul, according to Romans 12, says that nonconformity starts when an individual offers their life in total surrender as a living sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ. The problems in your life, the sin in your life, the lack of transformation in your family, your neighborhood, or your culture is a direct result of your lack of total surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not going to put effort in surrendering your sin and your depression and your past and your future and the things you love and the things you hate all over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then you're not transformed enough to transform the world around you. We pick up the story in Acts 17, 17. I've got, I've got the next scriptures all lined out on the screen, but I'm going to have to kind of skip around. So I'm going to read 17 and 18, and then I'm going to go to verse 21 and 28. I had to kind of condense this down a little bit for you this morning. So Acts 17, 17 says this. So he, he being Paul, reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. The Apostle Paul is waiting for his traveling companions in Athens. He sees the idolatry of the culture around him and he decides, I've got to go find men that I can reason with to try and transform this culture. First, Paul is transformed. He sees the need. He notices the need. And now he, becomes, and now he starts to prepare himself to address the need. So he goes to the synagogue. Verse 18, there's a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers that began to debate with him in the marketplace. If we skip forward to verse 21, we get some background on the nature of the culture that Paul's trying to evangelize. Verse 21 says, All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there in Athens spent their time, listen to this, doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. All the people in Athens did was gossip and blog and read the current literature and be academics and love the worldly culture in which they existed and they were absolutely experts on that culture so much so that Luke right here in the book of Acts would be compelled to say these people spent their time doing nothing all they did was talk about and listen to the latest ideas following verse 21 the apostle the apostle Paul shares the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, with this audience. And in verse 28, he said, In him, in God, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. 
The two ways you have to prepare yourself to address the needs in our culture as we're going through this study. The first is you have to know your creator God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father but by me. Are you trying to get to God through your merit? Or are you trying to get to God through your secret behavior? I think those of us in churches would like to think, if I evangelize this many people, or I memorize this much scripture, or I teach this class, or I volunteer in this ministry, that I'm gaining some pathway to God. Jesus would say that's false. It doesn't matter how much scripture you know, how much you volunteer, how often you preach or teach, or whether or not your attendance in church is perfect. Yes, you need to know the word of the Lord. You also need to have an intimate relationship with the Lord of the word. Ezra was going to lead this same kind of group of exiles back to Jerusalem that are grouped into that time frame with Nehemiah, who we read about earlier. Ezra did some mighty things for God. In Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, we get some insight into how Ezra was able to be used so significantly by God. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, the Bible says this, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. For Ezra to be mightily and powerfully used by God, he had to know his creator He had to seek the law of the Lord, and it wasn't enough just to become familiar with God's laws. He prepared his heart to really live that out despite the trial and tribulation that may come. Such is the case of the Apostle Paul, is it not? He really prepared himself to live out the gospel that transformed his life. We have to be of that same mindset and of that same commitment. Not only do we need to know the Creator, we need to know the culture. Well, wait a second, Trent, are you saying I should watch cultural movies that are nasty and R-rated or read books that uh, are extra biblical and, and, and sinful in nature or immerse myself in culture? Isn't this sermon series about the opposite of that? Yes. I feel like I should fill in right there, duh. You actually are an expert in some particular area of the culture. I don't know if you knew this. I want you to repeat this after me. I am an expert. Say that. I am an expert. Let's say that again. I am an expert. If nothing else today, your self-confidence and sense of self-efficacy grew just a little bit. Okay? You did some positive self-affirmation. You're an expert in the area from which you've been delivered. You're an area in the expert from which you've been delivered. Have you lived through the tragedy of losing a loved one, then you're an expert in getting through bereavement and grief. Have you been delivered from an abusive relationship where you felt like your life was at stake day in and day out? Then you're an expert on domestic violence. Have you been delivered from drugs and alcohol and substance abuse? Then you're an expert in recovery and sobriety. Was your marriage at one point on the rocks? Did you live through infidelity or unforgiveness or bitterness? If any of those things apply to you, then your ministry is the, is the ministry of marital reconciliation. You're an expert in that part of the culture. You don't have to go and, and prostrate yourself before some element of cultural depravity to become an expert in that particular form of culture. You just simply have to look back at the course of your life and see where God's delivered you from and realize that those are the things I'm an expert in that only I could say what I have to say about those experiences in my life. Here's the other challenge, friends. If you can't look back at your life and find a place where God totally, miraculously, supernaturally delivered you from some sin or bondage that you had in your life, then you got to go back to that place of needing total transformation and surrender. You should be able to look back at your life and see a moment in time where God delivered me from sin or pride or arrogance or unforgiveness or bitterness from a time that I faced a problem that I knew was greater than anything I could handle and God totally delivered me from that because I completely surrendered it to Him. And if you can't point to a moment in time like that in your life, then you better get your life in total surrender to Jesus Christ. This is what I think the world and the culture around us is missing. 
is people who are really living day in and day out completely and totally surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pick up the story in Acts 17. I'm in verse 32 now. The Bible says this. When the people listening to Paul heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on the subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed, and among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. This is the reality. If you see the need and you're totally transformed, be prepared to meet the need by knowing the Creator and remembering the area of culture you've been delivered from, because that is the area of your most effective and likeliest ministry. And at that moment, you've got to realize that there is going to be criticism from the enemy and from people who are still immersed in sin, that are insensitive to the Holy Spirit as you're going about trying to help them transform and transform that particular area of the culture. Friends, do not let that discourage you. On the contrary, let that encourage you. I used to be in sales in some sense, and one of the best sales techniques I ever learned was when somebody said, Trent, today, I want you to see how many no's you can get. See how many people you can get to turn you down. I think so often when we share our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's so personal to us, and it's such a vulnerable thing to really disclose where God's delivered me from, how I totally surrendered, and where I'm at now, that when somebody rejects that expression of faith, or the love I'm trying to show them to transform them and bring them out of the junk that they're living in, it hurts me, and that criticism takes me out of commission from living out the Great Commission. But man, don't let that criticism ever offend you to the point of feeling like you're not worth something in God's kingdom. That criticism and the experiences you have as you share your faith, those are your battle scars, friends. And we got to get active in the battle and we got to be prepared to have some scars and take some lumps if we're going to be agents of transformation. There are going to be times where you're going to connect. God's word will not return void. He's delivered you and given you a ministry and a purpose. That purpose is to carry out the great commission in the spirit of the greatest command, some people are going to be influenced by you and are influenceable by you. you got to take that step of faith out there, assume the identity of an expert in whatever it is you've been forgiven and set free from, and you got to go about trying to elicit change. Some people are going to connect. Some people are going to criticize. you got to be prepared for both. And here's the last thing as far as this is concerned. The fruits of your ministry and your efforts have everything to do with God and nothing to do with you. Amen. I think that's the other pitfall from our evangelism and our desire to transform culture. What if I do have some success? What if people do look at me and think, man, this guy knows some stuff. He's really got a powerful testimony or he's really been transformed or he really understands how to live in a, in a place of total surrender. Do not let the enemy allow that to go to your head. Amen. The Bible says to him that thinks he stands, that person should take heed lest he should fall. Pride comes before what? The fall. Say that again. Pride comes before the? Pride comes before the? If you allow your success in ministry or your expertise in your area of change to go to your head and elevate you to a point of pride, thinking, look at me, look what I can do, be prepared for your fall. Because this is all about God anyway. What are some take-homes from this? If I had to boil it up, and, and boil it down to the least common denominators. Here are the culture counters. So if you're in a, if you're in a boxing match, there's some counter punches that you can do. Punch over a guy's jab is a good counter punch. I, I have done some boxing training and stuff, but I have the best counter you can possibly imagine. You throw a jab at my face, I'm gonna hit that fist right with my chin, right there. <laughs> I'm gonna try and break your hand down, wearing you out with my chin, okay? I've actually tried that before. I can't tell you how the fight ended, but a couple of days later when I finally came to, I felt like I had done what I intended on doing. <laughs> so here are the counters to culture. First, I want to remind you of this. If Christians do not change culture, culture will change Christians. Amen. You cannot stay neutral in this fight we are in for all eternity. There's no neutrality. You're either trying to change, change culture or culture is trying to change you. So don't stay still. Be moving around. Be active for the kingdom. And the second piece of that, maybe the most important first step, is to realize that if you're going to influence culture, you cannot be immersed 
in that same culture. So Trent, what is culture? What does that mean for me? I'm, I'm not out in these like skater communities or drug communities or bars. I'm just a family guy that lives at home. How, do, how does that apply to me? Think about your marriage or think about your kids. That's your culture right there. You want to change the lives of your children? Then don't immerse yourself in the same sin-sick culture you're trying to draw them out of. Don't expect that if you've got pornography or unforgiveness or bitterness in your heart and life, you're going to be able to deliver your children from being immersed in that same kind of sin sickness. If you're trying to love your wife and bring her back into the fold and make her fall in love with you more deeply again, then you can't have the same kinds of sin and bitterness and frustration and resentment in your life against people you should be in relationship with and expect her to transform and be able to lead her out of that. That's incongruent and it doesn't work. You can't be immersed in the same culture you're trying to bring somebody out of. The sin in your life that's a foothold for you is exactly what the enemy is using to keep you ineffective in your family, in your friendships, in your business, even in the wider community. You cannot be immersed in the same culture you're trying to influence. So I don't know what the need is in your life. As we're moving through this, we're really going to deal with some hot-button controversial topics. We're going to give you the best biblical theology we can. We're going to ask you to prayerfully search your heart and search the scriptures with us as we go through this countercultural journey. But th for the journey to start today, it has to start with your transformation. So you've got to ask yourself, what are the areas in my life that are footholds for the enemy that are going to prevent me from applying the content of this series into my family or my marriage or my friendships and elicit some change? Whatever those things are, and I hope that challenges you, I'm going to dismiss in prayer, and I want you to bring those forward so we can pray over you and encourage you today. Let's pray. God, we love you. Thank you so much for a Bible-believing church that's committed to teaching truth. God, in a room this size, I know there are lots of people that the enemy is beating up and deceiving and trying to trap in sinful stuff. Please deliver those individuals today. God, while we sing and conclude these services, I ask for healing in Jesus' name. Amen.